Caitlin, I'm coming up. Angel, after me, we're going to have announcements afterwards. Um, I hear a little feedback, Mr. Vinny. Yeah. Hello, hello. Hi. <laughs> All right, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 3. When I made these balloons, I didn't, I didn't realize it was going to be a little bit as tall as I am. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stay here in the middle, if you can uh. see me. Some of you here can't see me. That's okay. That's okay. You know how I look like. Uh, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. There it is. Oh. Hope you guys have a good party tonight. Yes. 2015. So far this year, we have had several sermons. The first one was Keep the End in Mind. Do you remember that? How do you want to be viewed at your funeral? What would people say at your funeral? Mm. Okay, if you keep that in mind, well, that should change your behavior and attitude today, how you should act toward other people. The second one was the workshops, rise in God, rise in righteousness, rise in the love for the lost, rise in sacrifice, rise in service. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Amen. And then we had victory comes from God a couple of weeks ago that... The victory really is in your response, how you respond to people. Right. That's who, who people see in, in Jesus. If you are living like Jesus, how you respond, how you react to people reveals God in you right. or not in yeah. you. And then, of course, it's, the bullet's not there. You can't see it. But last week was the State of the Union uh. sermon, mm -hmm. right? And how many remember some of the things you guys brought up? When Joe preached, he said that, we need to help young Christians be stronger. Yeah. That was one of the things we need work to work on in this church. Yeah. The second one was evangelism. And of course, special missions, an increase in that just to do better. Yeah. The third one was a lack of heart in serving in certain areas. For example, we brought up the kids' kingdom, yeah. or benevolent, other benevolent things. The fourth one was a lack of depth in discipling and accountability. That was the thing that we brought up. And then uh, I think uh, oh. there's probably a fifth one. Uh, yes. Anybody remember that? There was a fifth family. point there that must have cut out. Help the families and youth, I believe. Is Help the family what? Family, youth and families. And okay. Strengthen okay, strengthen the youth and family, possibly. Joe, can, do you know? <laughs> you <laughs> <have> my notes. <laughs> Who preached that week, man? <laughs> oh. <laughs> North and South. Oh, yes. Yeah. North and South Connections. Yeah. I did put a fifth one there. It must have disappeared in the transfer. Yep. But we do have six meetings with the North and South. So these are the things that you guys came up with that we need to work on this year. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go after it. Amen. Today's lesson is called Deflate the Spheres. Nice. Oh, Deflate the Spheres. I have to bring it up because it was all over. The social media, for those of you who don't know, well, I don't need to explain it because it really isn't that important. <laughs> Except that today we're going to deflate the spheres in our lives. Amen? You with me? Amen. Come on. Let the air out. All right. Let's turn to John chapter 3. Come on, bro. Starting in verse 22. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And then they came to John and said to him, uh, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Mm. And to this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, 
And I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. All the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speak as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Wow. There's a lot of meat there on the bones. Before we get into that, I, I, I want to... I want us to remember that the most powerful passage in that section of the Bible really is what John the Baptist said. And what did he say? He said about Jesus, he must become greater and I must become less. They were baptizing people in the Jordan or the, the river there. Jesus comes along, he starts baptizing people. Then they get into an argument about, oh, uh, there's something going on here, John. In fact, Jesus is baptizing and he's kind of catching up and it was seen more as a competition. And so what does that do when if you have a business on the street and somebody else comes in with the same business on the same street, what does that do to you as a businessman? How should you feel if somebody else comes in with the same business on your street? If you have, a, for example, a barber shop. You feel a little bit threatened, right? Yeah. You feel a bit insecure. You feel like, oh, this is, this is not good. I need to beat them. I need to pass them or do something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's John the Baptist saying, you know what? I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I'm good. In fact, I'm fired up. I'm happy. Let Jesus come. In fact, let him baptize. Let him do even greater things. In fact, let me become less. <laughs> <coughs> That's a great attitude. Yeah. That's a humble attitude. Mm -hmm. Is that your attitude today? When it comes to your Christianity, remember last week Joe said, how real is your Christianity? He asked that question. Well, I believe if you look at your Christianity, it's got to become less of you and more of Jesus in your life. I don't know what you're doing to make that happen, but that's how it's got to be for the rest of your life, that's right, that's right. if you're gonna follow Jesus. Yeah. Cool. This takes great faith to do that. You know, Caitlin, I appreciate her. She was like, I don't like chores. I have a bad attitude about it. But since I follow Jesus, I'm gonna sing worship songs while I do it. Less of Caitlin and more of Jesus in her life. Yeah. Same thing with Joshua Collado. You know, I get up early in the morning. I can catch the bus at six, get ready, catch the bus and just go to school. But less of Joshua, more of Jesus right. in his life by walking with God. That's right. Are you with me? Yeah. This is what it means to deflate the spheres. You know, who is the center of your life right now? Who or what is the center of your life? Because really, whatever is at the center of your life, that's where your security is. That's where you get your source of wisdom. Right. That's what guides your decision making. And that's what actually gives you the power to act, to do what you need to do. Whatever is at the center of your life right now, that's what's overflowing from your heart. This is a, a pretty cool app. Anybody seen this? It's like a human body. Yeah. You can see the nerves flowing through. I don't know if you can hear that. Yeah. You can see that you can click on the lungs. You can click on different feet. Oh, the skeleton, the digestive system. <laughs> okay? My, my daughter clicks on this and she doesn't know what's going on. She just kind of clicks away. But it's really neat. And how did we end up with an app like this? How do we know what's inside the human body? How do we, how do we know? What do we need to do? Open it up. You gotta open it up! Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of graphic, right? <laughs> but for centuries, for centuries,
centuries, people. Yes, centuries. Yes. Centuries, the body was never opened up. Yeah. Because why? Well, religious convictions, it was ethically and morally not, you know, for a lot of people, it was just like, no, you can't do that. That's, that's a human body. You can't do that. So for a long time, this guy Galen, he would cut up open dogs and cats and mice and say, well, those guys have a stomach and a heart. Well, maybe they... Maybe that's where it is in the human body. That they were just kind of, kind of guessing. And then finally, you have, you had uh, this guy. You had this guy come in. Tom Brady. <laughs> Tom Brady, no. Andreas Vesalius. He got the courage. He started taking criminals. He said, you know, give me the criminals who have just been hung. Give me their bodies. And I'm going to find out what's inside the human body. And he had the courage to do it. And so that's what he did. He started writing a book. And of course, he received a lot of flack for it. Eventually, he got out of becoming a, you know, that practice. But this is what he did. He opened up his, the body in order to see what was inside, to see what was working on it. Well, how it worked, how it functioned. Well, spiritually, we got to do that too. Yeah, that's right. Yep. You gotta cut open your spiritual heart and you gotta figure out what's inside. Right. Yep. How you function, who you are as an individual, yeah. what your purpose is, what you value, where you're headed, where are you going. Yeah. If you don't do that, well, you're never gonna know how to get to heaven, first of all, and you're never gonna really know how to help other people. You gotta know what's inside your heart. What is at the center of your life. Jesus must become greater. We must become less. Those are my two points today. Write it down, memorize it, and then put it into practice. Look at the message version. You don't have to turn there, obviously. You guys probably don't have the message version. But in Colossians 1, it says... We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything he created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken, dislocated pieces of the universe... People and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies. All because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together. Whole and holy in his presence this is my favorite part. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Every creature under heaven gets this same message. See, I believe John the Baptist lessened himself because he saw Jesus as the greatest thing on this planet. He lessened himself and made Jesus greater because Jesus is the gift that we don't walk away from. Everything starts with Jesus. He is the center. He should be the center of our lives. That's our goal as disciples. We start with him in our mornings, hopefully. Amen. If you have to do it in the afternoon, amen. As long as you know
that that's where your source is. Your security should be in Jesus, Jesus' love for you. Not in any other man. Your wisdom should be that of his principles, his teachings. Your decision making, how you act, how you behave, how your attitudes are, should reflect that of Christ. And then the second thing, all the broken, dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and animals, get properly fixed and fit together in what? Vibrant harmonies. That means we're all here to get along because of what Jesus did. That's right. We're all here to reconcile, forgive, be unified with each other because of what Jesus did on the cross. He can actually bring us to unity. We can actually like each other. Oh. Yeah. We can actually love each other. Right. We can actually serve each other. I've heard many people say, oh, I, I, we just can't relate. Well, that's fine if you don't relate, but you've got Jesus to relate to. That's right. You can have commonality. Sometimes I sit, I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of the brothers and sisters there, and I'm looking around, I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. You're a different race. You're much more mature than I am. You're a teenager. We're all in the same room together. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. Except Jesus. Yeah. Because he gave us this church yeah. so that we can put it together in vibrant harmonies. You with me? Yeah. Yeah. The last point, you don't walk away from a gift like that. There is no back door. Right. If you've got a back door, it better be locked up. If you got a key, you better swallow it. I don't like to have a back door. It doesn't exist. I'm looking forward toward the cross. we got to persevere. Perseverance has to be your best friend. You can't give up on this faith. It's not an option, brothers and sisters. The gift is so much more amazing than you think. You don't walk away from a gift like that. We must become less. That means we got to deflate the spheres of influence. Here are my balloons. we got the different spheres of influences. Come on. What are the spheres of influences in your life right now? Is it enemy-centered? Is it friend-centered? Pleasure-centered? Possession-centered? Work-centered? Money-centered? Spouse-centered? Self-centered? And church-centered? Which one? controls your center right now. You know, if you are enemy-centered, which I have over here, if you are enemy-centered, your security is usually volatile based on the environment of your enemy. You're always wondering what he is up to. You seek self-justification and validation from those who are like-minded like you. You're guided by your enemy's actions. You make decisions based on what, you know, what will thwart your enemy. Your judgment is usually narrow and distorted. You're defensive, overreactive, and often paranoid. The little power you have usually comes from anger, jealousy, envy, resentment, and vengeance. Mm -hmm. Your enemy could be your spouse. It could be someone in your household or your family. Your enemy could be someone at work or your boss. If you're consumed by that person and that's greater in your life than Jesus, then there's a problem. And you need to deflate that. You need to figure out how to deflate that. The next one is friend-centered. You know, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus is not saying don't have friends. You've got to have friends, amen? amen? We're here to help each other. But if you see the church as a social club, right. Right. as a way to just hang out and have fun, and I'm here for the people because it's fun, the people are nice and kind and loving, then you're going to fall short in That's some right. way. That's right. Your security is a function of the social mirror. Your, your decision making is based on what will they think. <laughs> How will they view me? You're, in, you're easily embarrassed mm. because you're a people pleaser. Uh -oh. You value the uh -oh. opinions of others versus the, the opinion of God. You see the world through a social lens, a social club. You are limited by your social comfort zone. And really, your actions are as fickle as your opinion. you got to deflate that. That can't be the center of your life. The next one is pleasure-centered sphere. Pleasure. This can be smoking, drinking, drugs, yeah. sitting in front of the TV for hours. It could be music, 
which can be consuming sometimes for some of you. Anything that brings you comfort, rest, relaxation. Now, I'm saying amen for vacations, right? Yeah. Okay, nobody really likes vacations. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> amen for rest. I like my naps in the afternoons. But if this becomes the center of your life, then laziness will creep in. Yeah. And will consume you. You make your decisions based on what will give you the most pleasure. You see the world in terms of what's in it for you. Your power is actually negligible because you don't want to act. You just want to lie down or rest and relax. So whatever pleasure you, you think it is, that could be you. The next one is possessions-centered sphere, right here. Okay? Maybe I should pop it earlier, huh? Maybe I should pop a few more. Okay. Possessions. Okay? Your security is based on your reputation. Your social status or the tangible things you have. Yeah. All right? The latest electronics. You tend to compare what you have to other people. You tend to look at what others have and want what they have. You make your decisions based on what will, what will protect, increase, or better display your possessions. Mm -hmm. You see the world in terms of comparative economic and social relationships. You function within the limits of what you can buy or the social prominence of what you can achieve. Mm. This next one, everyone who works can relate to this. Mm. Yep. When you're focused on your work, you neglect what matters most, your relationships, yeah. your families, your children. You tend to define yourself by your role, your occupational role. Julius, mm. put a couple of holes in that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I put two already. You make decisions based on the needs and expectations of your work. You tend to be limited to your work role. You see your work as your life. Mm. You're focused on your role models, your opportunities, how to go up the ladder, your boss's perceptions. Maybe that's what your center is right now. Okay, that was following me. <laughs> Money-centered sphere. Maybe this is not most of us, but some of us. We want to make money. That's our focus. We all know that the love of money is greed, and that'll definitely hurt us. Okay, that one's working. We're going to pop these some more. That's great. Oh, there you go. <laughs> money centered. And brothers and sisters, the uh, financial peace workshop is coming up. I want to encourage you guys to take that. Heather and I took it three years ago. It has changed our lives. Yep. We are on the road to recovery. Now, amen, it's still a long road. But if you take it, you're going to gain some wisdom there with your finances. Yep. Some of us, we're in debt. Some of us, we're not very good with our finances. We need to repent and not make money the center of our lives. Amen? Amen. Some of us are family-centered. Now, amen, I love my family, I love my daughter. She got into the markers this morning. Markers all over her mouth, markers all over her hands. I put up her pictures on Facebook, got called out on it. You put too many pictures of me. Amen. <laughs> love my family, but really, is that why we're here? Right. It's not ultimately why we're here. That's right. Luke 14 talks about that Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must, you know, he must, in a sense, he says, hate his father and mother, wife and children, yeah. even, his, even his own self, if in order to become a disciple. You look that up, you study it out some more. Yeah. The next one is spouse-centered. You're focused too much. Your emotional dependency is on your spouse or your girlfriend or whatever it is in your life right now. Your relationship with that that person, that's where your emotional dependency, your decision making is based on how they're acting, their behaviors. The next one is self-centered philosophy. This is where our, our society is headed. A very narcissistic society, right? Yeah. Yep. The selfie, huge today. If you go on certain people's Facebooks, it's just pictures of themselves. Really, it's true. That's not what we want. We do not want to be focused on ourselves. Some of us, on the other hand, beat ourselves too much. Yeah. We're very low self-esteem. 
And so we get our value from how bad we look. And so we kind of get depressed and discouraged. That's also selfish. And then the last one is church center. This one's an interesting one. But this is more based on your religiosity. Okay? What happens? What's happening? We're behind you. The next one is church. Your security is based on church activity and the esteem in which are held by those in authority or influence the church. You find identity and security in religious labels and comparisons. This is more just the showiness of church. How you look. When you come in, you put on a mask. Everyone's fine and happy. Mm. But really, what's going on? That's right. What's going on in your homes? What's going on behind closed doors? Because yep. you can't be like that and then come to church thinking you're okay. Yep. We're not okay. We need help. We need God and we need each other in our lives. Are you with me? Yep. Yep. you got to deflate the spheres. And the last balloon left, of course, should be Jesus. You've got to make this greater in your life. Yeah. Because with Jesus, you're going to get to heaven. And that's the goal. With Jesus, you rise from the dead. Amen. Just to close out, deflate the spheres in your life. What is the strongest influences in your life right now? What is it? Let's, let's get honest. Yep. Because it takes away from what Jesus wants us to do, which is to help others get there as well. Uh, for me, I have to be honest with myself, it is work. My wife can attest that sometimes I get so consumed with my work that I neglect her. I'm working on it, brothers and sisters. Help me out. Pray for me. Sometimes the date night can be neglected. Sometimes the family time can be neglected. And I have to come to terms with that. That's very humbling for me. Sometimes I'm, I'm so focused on just self. Honestly, i got to be honest. Sometimes I'm very self-focused. Um, a brother called me out and said, you're a little bit self-reliant. You don't, you don't we like to rely on other people to get help and get advice. And I'm like, wow, that, that is me. I'm very self-reliant. Uh, Where is it that you stand? Come on. This is good. We're doing good on time. You ready for the conclusion? Yes. Come on. All right. Oh, God expects spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. I wanted to show you. <laughs> All right. Second John 1 through 12. I have much right to write to you, but I do not want to use paper in it. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Here's John. And the one practical here that I want you to take away from is face to face. Right. Brothers and sisters, we don't feel connected, we don't feel close, we don't feel the discipling is deep because you're not getting the face to face with each other. Right. Where two or three gathering his name, God is there. Right. And so if you're going to be part of this discipling church, you got to have the face to face. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to encourage you, if you want to make Jesus and God greater in your life, you've got to get into a Bible study. Right. And a Bible study is not by yourself. Right. It's face to face with another brother and sister in this room. You get to learn about God. You get to become more humble. And you get to really make it into heaven if you go down that path. That's right. If you come to our church service, there's brothers, there's people in this room that come to our church services regularly, but are not members. And when I say not members, you're not really part of a family group. Right. Right. Come into the family group. Yeah. Come to the events of the family group. Right. Become a member. If you're studying the Bible and you're on the fence and you want to make Jesus greater, the easiest thing is to get baptized. You got to study the Bible, repent, and then you get baptized in Christ. Many of us here have done that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the greatest decision that I've ever made. Yeah. Amen. If you're a member of our church and you're feeling stuck, mm -hmm. not connected, or just having a hard time, don't walk away from a gift like that. Yeah. Right. That's what it says. You need to get together with someone. You need to confess your sins if you've got sin. you got to ask for help. you got to get advice. you got to say, hey, this is... Where I'm at spiritually. 
Don't give in. Don't give up. Throw, don't throw in the towel. Throw away the key if there's a back door. Don't even have a back door. Make a decision now to keep persevering. Amen? Amen. And if you're doing well spiritually, for some of you who are fired up because you're like, this is none of me. I got God as my center. I'm happy. I'm fired up. I'm content. I love my life. Well, then go help someone become a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Go help someone know God. <laughs> Invite them to church. Study the Bible. I was with the singles yesterday at the mall. We just went out, five of us, sharing our faith. Invited people to church. Most of them, amen. They didn't come. They didn't come. But at least we were glorifying God. Amen. At least we were making Jesus greater in our lives. And it's not a checklist. It's not a religious thing. It's doing what God wants us to do. Yeah. So let's do that. Amen? Amen. Here's love. Here's the spirit of influence. But love is a verb. If you love God, you're going to put some action to this. That's right. That's right. Love is something you do. Right. Love is sacrificial. It's the sacrifices you make. The giving of self. You know, I appreciate those teenagers. They do love Jesus. Amen. They do love God. Because they're sacrificing their sleep. They're sacrificing a bad attitude. They're sacrificing what they need in order to bring glory to God. Amen. Let's become less. And let's make Jesus become greater. And now Angelica is going to share the announcements. Thank you for one.